So again, I said this and I want to review quickly. A New Testament community that does not move in the supernatural is just another community. We're not even a reflection of what the New Testament believers look like. What we have to do is destroy this paradigm that makes this stage the land of Oz and begin to help every believer understand that I have graces, I have anointings, I have giftings, I have power, I have authority. I can, I've been called to do the works of the ministry. That's not the ministry you're in, it's ministry. Do the work of the ministry. The things that we see the apostles doing, the things we see the apostolic community of the New Testament doing. That's what you and I are supposed to be doing, but the church has done well to try to separate the power. And so we've all grown up believing that the only power in the church is up here. But the, the true power of the church is the ministry of the saints. The greatest ministry in any city is not the most popular ministry or the man or woman of God who has the biggest church. The greatest ministry of any city is the ministry of the saints. Because that ministry is outdoing ministry when these heads of ministries are in meetings. What happens when I am in a meeting, but 300 of you are out doing ministry? And then we go to the next church and 300 of them are out doing ministry. You've got two pastors, but you've got 600 people doing the work of ministry. That's what we want to understand as we move and work with God, living out of the supernatural. Daniel Webster define the supernatural as this, and I think it's very appropriate. He says, it's that which is of or relating to an order of existence beyond the visible, unobservable universe. I've talked about that and shared it before. It's a departure from what is usual. As believers, we don't want to be or have the usual because things go on in our kingdom that are not usual. And so we want to be men and women who understand living life in the ways of God, transcending the laws of nature, upsetting forces, upsetting things that have been put in place because we transcend the laws of nature, not believing like other people believe because we see things differently and we refuse to have our life and lifestyle dictated to by what's in the culture or what's natural. We're above that and beyond it. The supernatural is that which is attributed to an invisible agent. We know that agent to be Holy Spirit. We know the working of Holy Spirit, the one who the church was given to on the day of Pentecost. Christ didn't, God did not turn the church over to the apostles. He gave it to Holy Spirit who led the apostles. He is the facilitator of the church and I, I see why God would probably trust him more than he would trust any flesh right so say this with me say I am learning I am expecting I am learning I am expecting and I'm living out of the supernatural I am learning I am expecting and I'm living out of the supernatural so let's look at this realm because the supernatural realm is meant to bury and defeat any earthly hindrance or blockage. It's meant to do that. that. That's the power of the supernatural, is that it destroys any type of earthly hindrance that is blocking people's lives and blocking regions from experiencing the quality of life that the kingdom of God presents. And so as supernatural believers, we... We stand in a place where it's our responsibility because of how we're endowed by God to vanquish any earthly afflictions, anything mentally. We should be able to destroy it. Anything naturally, spiritually, financially, 
physically. We should be able to deal with it. We should be able to route it because of this supernatural dimension that we live in and live from that has been put in place for those who confess Jesus as Lord, believe God raised him from the dead. You enter into a supernatural kingdom. So if I'm in a supernatural kingdom, I have to live how? Supernaturally. If I'm in a supernatural kingdom, I have to live supernaturally. We hear the saying that says, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, or when in the supernatural, do as the supernaturalists do. I do what I see done in the Word of God by men and women who carried out the supernatural dimension. It's the normal life for believers, normal being that which is typical or expected. It is typical for you to live supernaturally. It's expected. For you to live supernaturally by God it should be expected from one to another that we live supernaturally and move supernaturally but as well it should be what people around us in the marketplace expect from us I'm bringing you my headache what you got I'm bringing you a situation in my family what you got when they ask you for prayer they're really saying what you got when they come for counseling they're really saying what you got because I know you went to church but what are you coming back out of that church with telling me what apostle wore what apostle drove what kind of shoes apostle had on no no the heck with all that I'm going to release into your life the supernatural atmosphere that is in our house I'm carrying it into your life so bring what you desire let us put God on showcase and that's where we should be living from, but it takes confidence. So God is saying this, if you're going to live in the supernatural, you have to defy what is common. You have to defy it. You have to defy statistical explanations of things. I don't care one out of how many got something, did something, became something, I'm bringing it into the supernatural. I'm not living by statistics. I'm not living by what's common and what normally happens to someone when they experience this or they experience that or when they go over here or go over there. Oh, child, you don't want to go over there because when you go over there, oh, no, when I go over there, the supernatural comes with me. See what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not intimidated. I'm not fearful by what goes on over there. I'm, I'm not concerned about walking the streets of Charlotte where the drug dealer's on the corner because the supernatural is in me. And I'm believing by the supernatural that I have power in me to obstruct whatever's going on wherever I am. We have not been called to live under what we're supposed to be living over. If we believe that we are a people of power and authority, and we are, then we have to make sure that we are demonstrating power and authority. The body of Christ, uh, 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 Apostle Terry, more now has come into the place of articulation and not demonstration. You know, we have so much articulation. We know everything. I mean, I mean, it's amazing what we know and what we impart, but the demonstration's what's missing. And people around you that you encounter every day, it's good that you know Genesis to Revelations, but they're saying, can you be what's in Genesis to Revelation? Can you help this door be open that no man can shut? Can you bring me into a place of transformation in my body, my mind, in my spirit that is causing hiccups in my family? Can you help me shatter the delay that is over my life? Well, I have a dimension that I can bring you into that will help that to happen, but I'm going to need your participation. I mean, you, because the thing is that that's what soothsayers are asking for. It's what palm readers are asking for. It's what horoscope writers are asking for. They're saying, we've got our supernatural dimension. We want to avail it to you that we think you can benefit from what we carry. And they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. They don't have the power. They are imitations, but we want to be the real deal. Look at somebody and say, you're the real deal. Now, and it's time to live like the real deal. Okay, so we're not just doing church. We're doing the kingdom of God. So you and I have to make decisions 
to defy things. We have, because defying is the act of challenging a fact. I know what the facts are, but I challenge that in my supernatural. I challenge what they're saying. I challenge what they're doing. My child will not end up like that. My family will not end up like that. This will not happen with me. This won't go on with me. As, as we were talking earlier, Prophet, as you're saying things that had not happened in New York till supernatural manifestations showed up by someone who's carrying that dimension and understands that it can be activated because it is normal for the believer. The supernatural realm, again, is meant to bury and defeat earthly and heavenly hindrances. There are things that are not getting from heaven into the earth. And the supernatural is the dimension through supernatural prayer and through fasting and through mapping and through other spiritual technology. We can bring things that are above Daniel's head into the earth and provide the answers and breakthrough that people need. So, so, so what God is saying to us is, I want you to be more than just a church goer. I want you to be a societal antidote. I want you to be the answer. I want you to get people out of darkness into the marvelous light beyond just leading them to Christ, which I thank God for and is wonderful and excellent, and we've got to do it. But somebody say, there's more. And, and, and you are in a place where you're not in elementary school, you're not in junior high, you're in college, and this college level anointing is requiring us to be more and to do more. Nothing is usual in the dimension of God. As we step into this dimension, what are we doing? We're gaining understanding. And here's what we have to do. We have to understand that from the natural eye, hear this, from the nat because, because I got to deal with some stuff that may be in you that you're not aware of because some people get afraid of supernatural. Okay? As we move in this dimension, we have to understand that from the natural eye, the supernatural dimension appears to be messy. I just got this dress out of the cleaners. I don't want him to lay hands on me and put me on that floor. I don't know where his hands have been. It gets messy. Because things are shifting and changing and happening and people don't like change. But this dimension is to bring change. Look at Proverbs 14, verse 4. And, and, and it's going to appear messy. A lot of people don't want to speak in tongues because they think something's going to happen. A lot of people don't want to deal in deliverance because they're afraid something's going to happen. Keep avoiding it and something will keep happening. <laughs> Look at Proverbs 14, 4. It says... Where no oxen are, the grain crib is empty, but much increase of crops comes by the strength of the ox. The ox is symbolic of the apostolic. Say, we are an apostolic community. I said that because I'm not going to let y'all just put it on me. This is our stuff. This is the kingdom stuff. We are an apostolic people. The ox is symbolic of the apostolic. So when Jesus comes in, we begin to encounter on his entrance that which he did that was then passed to the apostolic company that he was with. And what did he do with them? He trained them and he equipped them. He spent three and a half years with them, preparing them for the day of Pentecost and what would come after that. So he trained and equipped them, hear this, and what he did with them, if you follow the life of Christ, it did not promote a nice, neat, organized, predictable way of life. And that's what church folk want. We want a nice, organized, can they just sing a song for three minutes instead of 13? Do we have to come in and listen to intercessory prayer? Because I just want to get in and get out. You know, they start praying at 940. What if apostles started at 940? We could get out a little earlier. 
Because we, we, we see these things that go on that are normal, and before we know it, we want what's predictable in the church. I want to know when Apostle's going to minister. I want to know what he's going to minister. I remember the old church, we had a bulletin, and Reb so-and-so had the scriptures written down that he was a, I wish we could go back to the old time way. That's what God us in the message we're in. Not all of it was bad. It served a purpose, but how many of you know God's doing the next thing? And, and you and I have to put ourselves in a place where we understand that what God wants to do and what he's done through Jesus and what he did all the way through the Old Testament and now, it was not nice. It was not predictable. It was not an organized way of life. Everyone knows what's in the manger when the oxen are there. A mess. Put an ox in a manger. Put an ox in an empty crib and you will be amazed at what the ox will do to it. In the crib, when the ox gets there, is a perceived mess. And that's the way a lot of people see the supernatural. Oh, you don't want to bring that into your church because that's just going to create a mess. We already got a mess. <laughs> we got these ungodly, unkingdom mindsets, attitudes, paradigms, thought processes, models that are already a mess. It's contraceptive church where we conceive nothing because we are trying to have birth control. We don't want the spirit birthing because if that child comes in, we got to take care of it. And so what do we do? Let's just keep it as normal and let's just keep our 2.34 children. Not realizing that there is a, a, a group of people in this city who are yearning for supernatural ministry into their lives and yearning to be a place, a part of a place where God is demonstrating and moving in the supernatural. And yes, God does that here, but somebody said there's more. And with where God is taking us and where God has us right now, we've got to get into the more level where everybody is participating, experiencing, and distributing this level of demonstration. Who God is and what Christ did was all fueled by the supernatural. It was not just once in a while. You don't read through the Bible and once in a while God did something that was crazy. You don't look into the New Testament and see once in a while Jesus or the, the apostles did something. No, it was all the time. See, what we've got to be in Christ is discontent with once in a while. Let me say it over here. Because y'all was like, I'm cool with it. <laughs> once in a while won't work, y'all. Why? Because something's going on all the time in people's lives and in environments that need supernatural now and we just can't once in a while. But when you understand that this is the dimension I was born into when Christ came into my life and, 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 and Holy Spirit filled me and Christ baptized me into him, I begin to understand this is how I'm supposed to live. This is what's supposed to really come out of my life that sets me apart from any other worker in my company, any other entrepreneur that I am dealing with, any other matters that are going on. Supernaturally, I have a way, not by power or might, but by the Spirit to deal with them, and it's not just once in a while. It was the dimension that the early church was birthed into, and then they carried it. We cannot make this a series of teaching where it stops right here. You have to carry it. We have to get ourselves positioned and understand and learn, and we will, how to carry this, activate this dimension. See, when there's no awareness or thirst or demonstration of the supernatural, this is what churches do. And you, all y'all grew up in these churches. This is what they do. They create enough rules to keep anything that can go wrong from happening. They create rules. 
We got a rule here. That as soon as your child moves this from this place and jumps up here, your rule kicks in. It ain't in the church bylaws nowhere. It ain't on the wall nowhere. Ain't no sign, no, nothing in an email that says, get them cheering off stage. Would you rather them jump up here or jump into the club? Would we rather them jump up here where the anointing is, where the glory is, where maybe something they're dealing with or carrying just because they want to be in here brings a shift and a change in their life just because they're in here. Some things are just translated because you're in the environment. But we have a rule. To keep anything from going wrong. Because I, I, I don't want Pastor Hermione calling me, talking about my child was dancing around on, on, on the stage. Because we have rules. And churches, church leaders, create rules to keep anything that can go wrong from happening. And you know what? Those places become museums. They become monuments versus movements. Because if you eradicate Holy Ghost out of something, out of anything, all you have is what flesh can do. And what flesh will do is make rules and minimize who God is that people never get a chance to experience him. So what do they do? They evict the facilitator of the church, Holy Spirit, out. What am I saying? It's this. Little takes place in the spirit realm, hear me, without taking risk. Come on, I'm peeling layers right now. Very little happens in the supernatural realm or in the kingdom without risk taking place. Very little. Some stuff by God's mercy, you know, just happens, but, 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 but most churches don't want to take risks. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. Most churches don't want to take risk. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39 and 40. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and they had some supernatural stuff going on. That's why Paul writes to them about the spiritual gifts, because he's introducing this realm, this dimension to them in a, in a new way but he also has to, to, to help them understand some things. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39. Paul says, so, and he's ending up, to conclude. That's Paul concluding, not me. <laughs> so, to conclude, my brethren, look at what he says. Earnestly desire and set your hearts on prophesying being inspired to preach and teach and interpret God's will and purpose. And look at what he says. And do not forbid or hinder speaking in unknown tongues. Look at verse 40. He says, but all things should be done with regard to decency and propriety and in an orderly fashion. Verse 40, Paul says this. He says, all things should be done. Paul says, all things should be done. I like the way Chris Volaton says it. He says this, if you're going to set order, then something has to be going on. <laughs> if you're going to set order, some ought to be jumping off. That causes you to have to set order. If you're going to set order, then something has to be going on. Hear me. If nothing's going on, you don't need all things should be done. The expectancy of God is that something will be going on in our churches supernaturally. He started the church with a supernatural bang, Pentecost. And he doesn't have a problem with loudness, and he doesn't have a problem with things being soft. He doesn't have a problem with a bang. He doesn't have a problem with things being big.
big and exploding. He has no problem with that. He started the church with something happening. The expectancy of God is that something will be going on in our churches, preferably something that can only be contributed to the supernatural. <laughs> you can get flesh on your job, in your house, in the mall, okay? But when we come in here especially, supernatural things should be happening. I I'm even declaring right now, supernatural things are happening even as I speak. But when we come in here, God is expecting to have to respond because we're making a draw on the supernatural, not on our individual little problems. Because that's where we get so consumed. We get so consumed with our stuff that we discount that God's got bigger stuff. And better stuff. We okay? So what stops the church from stretching into the supernatural? Simple. Fear. So, so, so as, 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 we're, as we're, we're learning in this dimension, as we're bringing it in so that we're not a once in a while church, but we are a this is who we are and this is what goes on in here, church. Understand the first thing that's going to grip people is fear. You want to get baptized in the Holy Ghost? Holy Ghost. We, we, we fear. You know why we fear it? Because we can't control it. Most believers won't get breakthroughs in life because we're trying to control God. We're trying to tell, we, we say, Father God, your will be done, but do it like this. <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done, like this. And then we want to call somebody a Jezebel because they're controlling. We got our own Jezebelic stuff going on with God. The whole body of Christ does. Trying to control God. So many churches will never let him in by his spirit. It'll be a part of their what we believe, but that's centered on the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, but you ain't going to go further and say we believe in his activation. Because we don't want his activation. Why? Because that ox is going to mess up our nice little seats. And I paid for that seat. My money went into that carpet. Now we're going to have stuff on it. So we begin trying to control him. And you know what he does when he feels controlled? He's, he's, he's grieved and he's quenched. Hear me. What, what God's going to start doing is, is, is presenting supernatural opportunities to you. And hear this. You're not going to know what to do. But hear this. The person you're talking to don't know you don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know. Just break it. Do something like that. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> They're like, my God, she broke down into something and just did like that. And the next thing I knew, I was feeling better. They don't know. <laughs> You're just trying to work the, the, the butterflies out. My God, the power that came out with, I don't know. Somebody say, just go ye therefore. If, if the Holy Spirit puts you there, he'll show you what to do. 
And, and he might have you spit in their eye. There was this guy named Jesus who did all kind of just crazy stuff. You asked him a question, you know, are we going to eat? There was a man. <laughs> we'll eat or not, man. There was a man. Because the supernatural's kicking in. There was a man. Supernatural changed your voice. How you doing? But fear set me. Many leaders teach this scripture but don't have anything going on. So it really becomes a controlling and manipulative statement creating a controlling, manipulative, Holy Spirit inactive culture. What they're trying to do is set rules that will block the move of God. Nothing's going on. Paul spoke to it because things were going on. But in most of our churches that are using this and use it as a way to regulate him, ain't nothing going on. Great word, great buildings. You know, they're, they're changing traffic patterns on Sunday morning, but nothing's going on. Hear me. Fear will keep you from moving in the spirit. Fear will keep you. From, I, I'm having a battle right now personally that I can't tell you. No, I've got four battles right now. I can't, can't tell you about them right now. I've got four battles personally that fear is trying to grip me, but on the other side of them, I think, are great opportunities to manifest the kingdom of God. I'm going to be honest. You have not a priest that has not been touched by your infirmity. I've been touched by fear. I'm touched by fear often. It knows my name. But I know that it's also false evidence that appears real. So I know it and it knows me. And now we're in the battle to see what, how are you going to operate? You know, we're looking at a new building. Dude called me Friday. I said, I ain't answering that. Fear. The apostle has fear. Yeah. Phone rang. I saw it was him. I just started talking to nobody that was in the room with me. Picked it up. I'm in a meeting. No, I didn't do that, but I was like, I ain't answering. Because here, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready in the spirit to answer it, but I should have been. So then I called him back in my supernatural voice. Hi, right, this is Terrell. Sorry, I miss you, uh, you know, busy day, and I'm, uh, you know, but hey, let's, let's make sure we uh, get together Monday. <laughs> got, some, got some meetings Friday and Saturday, and I, hey, look forward to talking to you. Because when the phone rang, I felt like I wasn't in control. So when I called back, I felt like, now I'm in control. Well, God was wanting to do something right then. But I'm waiting till I feel like I want to move in the matter. Now, I've been decreeing, I've been declaring, I've been prophesying, I've been walking around the building, I've been shouting, I've been doing everything. And then here, here comes the showdown. I ain't getting that. You churching, praying, going through everything. Now you get to work, somebody got a headache. I do too. See what I'm saying? So, so the biggest enemy to this is the unknown. You don't know how you're going to look. You don't know how, what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to go on. You don't know what you got to deal in. And so I become fearful even to prophesy. And I know God said it. He wrote it on my mirror. But I'm still afraid to say it. And then what does fear do? It masquerades as wisdom. Well, I don't think it would be really prudent to pray for one of my employees in our cubicle. 
They asked you in your cubicle. They came to your cubicle. You on my territory now. <laughs> but, but, but wisdom would say, you know, I, I don't know how HR will receive this. So, so we, we, we begin to move in, in realities uh, uh, and, and, and mindsets that really aren't of God, but we make it of God. The truth is this, underneath the mask, not your mask, underneath the mask is a believer who doesn't want to look bad. As soon as they came down this morning, what does the adversary say to me? Ain't nothing going to happen. You're going to look stupid. Ain't nothing going to change in their lives. And, that, and, and, and you have to understand, if you're moving in the supernatural or you now begin to see that God is taking you into places where you've got to move in his power and in his authority and by his spirit and with his words, you, you're going to find yourself having to wrestle against things that are going to speak and tell you no need to do that. That won't work. They don't believe anyway. Who are you to lay hands on somebody? Who are you to say you've got a word of knowledge or, or the word of the Lord? Who are you to give that amount? Who do you think you are to do that? And, 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 and we begin to move in these places because we don't want to look bad. Bill Johnson says this. He says, the Holy Spirit is imprisoned in the bodies of unbelieving believers. The Holy Spirit is imprisoned in the bodies of unbelieving uh, 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 believers. Faith removes fear. And faith requires risk. Now, I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. The only way you're going to remove fear is faith. But faith requires risk. If Jesus was touched at all points by the things we're touched at, it meant that Jesus probably had some moments when he knew he had to do the work of the Lord, but maybe he was a little anxious. Maybe he was a little fearful. Maybe darts were coming at his mind telling him this and telling him that. See, you, you and I have to understand that you're walking a journey that Christ walked, but where faith is concerned, it requires risk. You will not build your faith if you don't take risk. And an ox does not do things that everyone else would say are the proper things to do at proper time. Not an oxen type people. Risk means this, it means to place something of value in a position where it can be lost. My reputation, my dignity, who I am in the church. You know, maybe somebody else can lay hands on you because, you know, right now I've laid hands on three people and all of them have gotten healed and you know, I'm a little nervous about doing it a fourth time. So, so call bruh so-and-so. A little fearful. Don't want to take the risk. Don't want, don't want to mess up my perfect healing record. I've always been accurate in the prophetic. I, I don't want to mess that up. Let me tell you something. You call yourself a prophet, you're going to mess something up. You're going to miss something sometime. Ain't nobody going to stone you. And if they say they are, that ain't God. But you're going to miss things. You're not going to get things right. You're not going to stay with the everything. You, you, you're going to call something out in somebody and, and that ain't what they're going, that they've got going on. And then they'll say, what's really going on? You'll say, close. No, don't do that. Don't do that. But you're not, you're not going to, you, 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 hear, hear this, you're, you're not God. We're an instrument in God's hand. Risk is one of the main catalysts to a supernatural lifestyle. Look at John 12. We're going to finish in just a moment. Look at John 12. Look at John 12, verse 4 through 7. John 12, verse 4 through 7. It says, but Judas Iscariot, 
Judas Iscariot, the one of his disciples who was about to betray him, said this. When Mary was washing, Mary Magdalene uh, yeah, was washing uh, uh, Jesus' feet. It says, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii, a year's wages for an ordinary workman, and that money given to the poor? So Judas, who was the treasurer, said, I tell you, hold up, says, why are we doing something different with this money? Now, hear this. Judas was a thief, and Jesus knew it. But he made him the minister of the treasury. Knew he was a thief. So why would he make him the treasurer when he knew he was a thief? Number one, we could say to make him fail. Well, I don't think so. I don't think God's operating like that with Judas. Number two, I believe it was because Jesus developed a culture of faith around him. Stay with me. The faith culture was manifested in this way. Jesus trusting people before they deserve to be trusted. Faith. Before they deserve to be trusted, I'll trust him, which meant Jesus took what? A risk. Jesus says, I'm going to take a risk on this dude. Hear this. All that Jesus did was risky. I want to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? He'd take risk. See, we, we don't see Jesus as taking risk. We just see that everything he did worked out okay. But we don't understand that he was putting God's name on the line. He was putting heaven's name on the line. He was taking risk. Supernatural manifestations come from risk that we take. Nothing can be saved. Life for him wasn't a nice grain crib because the chief ox was always treading. Always, tre always stepping into something. Always moving in a way, believing that the backing of heaven, a supernatural kingdom, was coming behind him. So I close with this. If we're going to be a catalyst for renewal and reformation and advancement in the kingdom of God, personally, corporately, and in the marketplace with people we know and don't know, guess what? We have to take risks. It's just a part of who we are. It requires us becoming a house and a people that develop our faith in God. Why? So he can move supernaturally. My faith moves God. And the only way he can move is supernaturally because he's supernatural. So if I'm going to move God in my family's life, move God in my finances if I'm gonna move God in my entrepreneurship if I'm gonna move him in the ministry he's given me I'm gonna have to have faith and I'm gonna have to have enough faith that allows me to take a risk because either I believe that all things work together for the good or I don't but I gotta take the risk and many of us, as I'm talking even earlier today about these jobs that are available in corporate America, people can't find people. Why can't you be found? Because you don't want to take the risk. I'm used to my $18 an hour. I don't want to become an executive where I can't control my time anymore. Because now I'm on a greater salary with greater responsibility and I don't want to get into all that. No, what you're really saying is I'm too afraid to take the risk. Ecclesiastes 11, 4 through 6 says this. 
He who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you know, what is the way of the wind or how the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a pregnant woman? Even so, you know not the work of God who does all. In the morning, sow your seed. In the evening, without withhold not your hands. For you know not which shall prosper. Whether this or that or whether both alike will be good he who observes the wind I know something needs to happen but I will not take the risk my husband is sick my child is sick I see an action that needs to be spoken to I need to yield my life I see the wind blowing, but I won't take the risk. Why? Because I'm regarding the clouds. I'm regarding the bad that could come out of it. And as long as I look to the bad to come out of my stepping into something by faith, I will not do it. I'll stay away from it. Why? Because I've already built a cloudy day. Well, what if this goes wrong? And what if this goes wrong? And what if this, what, but what if it goes right? Why do we side with darkness before we side with light? And disguise it as wisdom. No, it's a lack of faith that has me trusting what won't work before I trust what will work. So I'm afraid to move because I've given darkness more power than God. I've given my past and my history and things that haven't worked out. Because I've laid hands on someone and they didn't get healed before, I will not do it again because of the cloud. Well, number one, I'm not doing the healing. I'm just showing up. God's doing the healing. When he wants to, how he wants to, where he wants to, it's just by his stripes we're healed. It's on God. He just said, Murphy, will you demonstrate faith? Will you take the risk? And God is saying to you, I, I want to step you into something that your mom and them didn't walk in. That a lot of your friends won't step into. That a lot of the body of Christ won't step into. Prophet Terry, Apostle Terry, I mean Prophet Renee, Apostle Terry, move in what they move in because they will take risk. It is not safe in the kingdom, but the fruit is out there on the limb. That's where the fruit is. And I can't get the fruit if I won't take the risk. You know what's happening? The Lord tells me. In Bible stories we've been reading, now you're starting to see that Newcastle's bad, man. They, they were something else. They were walking into stuff, furnaces, lion's dens, king's courts, they was coming up against stuff that they didn't know how it was going, but they took the risk because they believed that there was a supernatural, was that supernatural? No. A supernatural dimension was backing them. I believe God. I believe in the power of God. I believe nothing is too hard for God. I'm not talking about my mom and dad. They have limitations, elder. They've got limitations. God has no limitations. Ha! Ah! And he has created a dimension where we can carry out that which will bring glory and honor and fame to his name. But you got to take risk. 